Hello everyone, we're going to get started here. <clears throat> I believe I got everything set up correctly. I got a little checklist that I do when I go on Twitch and even still sometimes I'll accidentally leave the sound on Twitch and then I'll get this uh, echo going or my microphone isn't working and I forget to look and make sure that's happening. So all sorts of things can go awry, but uh, I believe I have everything in place. <clears throat> the one thing I didn't do is turn the fan on because I think it's uh, cool enough in here, but I can almost guarantee at some point I'll need to stand up and take care of that because it is on the checklist. Today I'm going to be editing another story called Night She Missed the Rock Show. Uh, this is a, um, <clears throat> it's similar to the title of a Joe Lansdale story called The Night They Missed the Horror Show. Now, of course, the Lansdale story is uh, far superior, one of the greatest horror stories ever written, short story, and uh, mine is nowhere near that league, but the title is a tribute to that. Now, this uh, story is a little long. It's about 9,000 words. If I'm a good editor, I'll cut a few of those words out, but we'll see how that goes. Um, I don't tend to do as much cutting as I need to, and that's where professional editors really do help me out a good bit. But short stories are kind of a place where you can play a little bit, I think. Um, this story originally appeared in Middletown 3, Metal Apocalypse. There are four uh, anthologies in the uh, Middletown series, and a number of different authors, you can see them listed there, great authors, uh, contributed stories to that work. And all those stories are a little bit on the longer side. They're uh, in the range of uh, 10,000 10, words. Mine was 9,000. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, each of the each of these uh, anthologies is a little special. One thing about them is that uh, every author is given this a uh, similar set of characters and a similar um, story setup, and then each author writes their own stories within those setups, um, and that tends to be. Uh, where where they kind of go differently is where is how the authors play those out. So each of the stories in the anthology, again, um, share some characters, share some story details, and then the authors go in all sorts of different directions, all those stories being zombie stories. And uh, this one is about a particular concert, and um, I talk about somebody who missed the concert. All right, so we'll jump into that. All right, everything looks good. These new... Um, <clears throat> These new setups that we have here, frames and everything, are my, things my wife put together. She's very talented, and I don't deserve her. All right, Night She Missed the Rock Show by Jay Wilburn. They said 14 was still too young for her to go. They always said that about her, and she had a creeping suspicion they always would. Um, sneaking is probably a better word than creeping, but I, I kind of wanted to use the word creeping in here, so I use it a couple times for uh, her suspicions. Addison wondered if they would have let her go if she were a boy. No way to know. They had a boy before her, and he made it to three years old, but that was it. His name had been Robert after her father. After her father, I should probably say his father. Maybe their father. After their father. <clears throat> Born and died all before they had Addison as a consolation baby. Someone ran over little Robbie Jr. when he, no one was looking at some family picnic thing. Her grandmother had let slip once that her parents had almost gotten divorced over it, but having her had held the ship together. Addison had that same creeping suspicion that her dead brother, who she never met, I'll put commas there, who she never met, was the reason she was never going to be allowed to go anywhere or do anything. Her parents were already talking about her commuting to Middletown for college so they could save money. She might be the consolation baby, but they weren't going to let her slip out in the street and get run over during a picnic. Hell, they mostly canceled on everything resembling picnics. All right, so that's a lot of backstory, and I might want to um, add something there in the beginning that sort of connects it to what's happening uh, but I don't know. We'll have to see. Okay. A semi buzzed close to the shoulder of the road. Tall grass whip shot around her jeans, and the wind laced with diesel swirled over her, twisting her dark hair and ruining the line of red streak she had carefully dyed into it. In the darkness, did I spell died right? I tend to misspell that. <clears throat> In the darkness, 
the headlights washed her out in halogen light. Let's say white instead of light. Halogen white. Instead of saying light twice. Halogen white. And then the demon red of the taillights eased her back down into the night with the dying wind. The driver either did not see her or did not care. Either way, Addison put one foot in front of the other, headed west on the shoulder of the wrong direction, on, of the wrong side of the road, leading out of Chiro toward the civic center in the city. She felt the chill rise through her body, which had nothing to do with the air around her. She imagined herself splattered on the grill of a semi, maybe sucked into the vortex of exhaust and swept under the wheels to be run over 18 times. If Julia and Robert lost their consolation baby too under the wheels... Okay, let me put commas around that because that'll make that a little clearer. Not necessary grammatically, but I'm going to do it anyway. Two, under the wheels of a truck, because no one was watching when she snuck out in the middle of the night, their fragile marriage wouldn't survive that. She had that creep in her mind that the way dark, the way dark truths tended to come to her, like trying to put together a puzzle that was all black. It wouldn't end in divorce this time. Her father would shoot himself in the head in the garage, and her mother would wither away in whatever chair she happened to be in the moment she heard the news. Addison hated how they treated her, confined her, kept her captive like some princess in a lonely tower in the most boring town in the state, if not the entire country. She still didn't want them dead. She wished they'd moved from Chiro. <clears throat> her father still worked a warehouse management job not far from the civic center. They said they liked the quiet and the schools, but the schools sucked. The kids were rednecks and mean. Beck was her only friend and the only one who appreciated what Addison liked, but even that was changing, now wasn't it? Chiro wasn't that quiet either. It was a wide spot in the road, and from their house you could hear the trucks blasting past all night. The speed dropped from 65 to 45 at the one red light, but no one followed that rule and there were no cops in Chiro. Just the county sheriffs who came if there was a fight in the bar where her dad hung out until closing most nights. Nowhere to have a concert, which was why she was walking along the dark highway at night. Already late, because Chiro was dead and boring, and Beck had abandoned her again. Someone was coming. A man staggered in the field a few yards farther off the highway, moving with traffic toward Addison. He listed drunk in, in a way she recognized on the nights her father walked home, leaving his car in the bar's gravel back lot. She crouched down in the grass and remained still. The dark crawl inside her warned her this guy would be willing to do bad things to a stupid girl trying to walk all the way to the Civic Center in one night before FLX's... FLX's Flexes? I guess that's the name of the band. This was the one detail that was the same in that anthology for everyone's uh, <clears throat> story. Flex's set and Encore were over. The Peachy Keens had canceled. So had the Lansdales. So only the Lansdales were opening for Flex now. Still, Flex was big time in the metal scene. Everyone was big time for a girl from Chiro, but still. They would probably still start late. She could still make it, even on foot. She knew it. If she could get past this guy, she hoped. Maybe if she avoided getting raped and murdered by a drunk off the highway. The man almost lost his footing, but continued forward after several bobbled steps. If he went face down in the grass, she wasn't sure what she would do. Sneak forward past him in hopes he was really out? Just go by, she whispered. He growled. The asshole was growling. God, please, don't let them be a meth head instead of just a drunk. Another tractor trailer topped the hill and barreled toward their position in the glowing, growing glow of headlights. The man turned, and a, and a split second of clear view followed before the blaze of halogens washed him out into silhouette. His face was scarred and discolored. He was definitely an addict on something. He might do worse than just rape her if he discovered her crouched in the grass. This was all Beck's fault. Her secret boyfriend in high school was supposed to drive them, but the one time Addison slipped away from home for a show, 
Beck had backed out. Addison wasn't about to sneak back into the house, defeated, so here she was hiding in the grass. The light filled the world, and Addison felt the shape of her own shadow spreading out behind her, like a hole in the universe. The man's wild eyes followed the passing fury of, of the rig, and before the light dropped to the demon tail, tail lights, she met eyes with him. He stared right at her before the darkness felled again, then he staggered toward her. Addison stayed down and frozen. His arms extended in front of him, and he growled louder than the before. The mad, animalistic noise made her think of something other than human. She should have run, but her body locked in hiding position like a frightened rodent. The truck engine receded, but the monster of a man still angled onto her. Run, you stupid bitch, he demanded of herself. She felt her legs finally unlock, but then he turned away from the road. He passed by her close enough that she could smell he had soiled himself. She forced herself to breathe through her mouth, but slow so he wouldn't hear. In the dark, she saw vomit ooze from his mouth. It was thick and greasy in the starlight and made her think of blood. Addison choked down her gag reflex to avoid making any noise. He swished on through the grass and she listened to his retreat, but was afraid to turn around. She listened to the uneven crunch in the grass as he went. She decided to wait until she could not hear him any longer. Then she would move. Then she would look. Finally, she would make it to, the, to a damn rock show. The Faceless had come through on the Summer of Slaughter tour. Beck had gotten tickets as a gift from her parents who owned the feed store in Chiro. Addison was invited and Beck's older cousin was going to drive them. Of course, Julia and Robert had forbidden it, so Beck took Susan, who didn't know progressive metal from black metal. Addison had to watch clips from Beck's phone later while on the edge of tears. Beck had met her secret high school boyfriend that night. Because the archetype played a surprise show at a club in Hanson. Be becoming the archetype, I'm sorry, played a surprise show at, the, at a club in Hanson. Beck snuck out to go because her parents were out of town. Addison ended up stuck with her parents at church. Beck got the show and went all the way with her boyfriend that night, too. She had pictures on her phone of both events. Becoming the Archetype changed lineups again, and the new album hadn't come out, probably meaning she had missed her last chance to ever see them live again. Beck faked a sleepover at Susan's house so they could go see Zero Hour in the city. Addison's parents called, and Beck's cousin sold herself as Susan's mom. There was suspicion, but by some miracle, Addison got out of the house. Jason and Trey were twins in the band and so hot. They thrashed hardcore. Beck's boyfriend drove the girls halfway there before finding out the show was canceled. Trey had hurt his hand and had, a, had to have surgery. They'd probably never play a zero hour again. Addison came home early in tears and went to bed, telling her parents Susan got sick and the whole thing was called off. Now she was out for now she was out for flex, and nothing was going to stop her. Not even Beck bitching out on her. Beck was into the into the folk metal now. She said, "Folk metal for God's sake, was this the damn nineteen nineties in Eastern Europe?" What the hell, Beck? Addison did, didn't even know her anymore. The sound of footsteps in the grass behind her were gone. She stood, but did not dare look. She just ran. She ran until she tripped over something in the grass and fell on her face between a plastic milk jug and the gravel for the raised shoulder where the highway slope began. Addison found her feet and did turn to see if the meth monster tracked her once more. Everything and nothing seemed to move around her in the dark. Her heart raced as her eyes refused to focus on anything except the splotches of color which traveled through her vision in time with her pounding heartbeat. Each thump brought a bright spot of pain behind her eyes. Nothing moved. She tried to tell herself so even though she tried to tell herself so even though the spotty even through the spotty betrayal of her eyes. That sense is a little awkward. She tried to tell herself so. Say, comma? 
I don't know if that fixes it. She tried to tell herself so, even though even through the spotty betrayal of her eyes. I, I'll leave it. He was gone and wandering toward Chiro, miles down the highway, where nothing happened and no cop would be there to bother the meth ed. She could piss on the side of, he could piss on the side of the bar where her father spent his evenings. He could sleep under the awning of Beck's parents' feed store, or he could eat the face off of a possum. Maybe Chiro was the perfect town for a guy like that. Enjoy, fucker. Her voice came thready and with a crackling wheeze at the end. Addison turned and resumed her journey up the slope along the shoulder of the wrong side of the highway. She topped the hill and saw nothing but dark road ahead. It wound through the landscape ahead with shadowy forests clustered on one side and empty fields stretching out on her... Okay, let's say on the opposite side. The opposite side let's see if that fixes it it wound through the landscape ahead with with shadowy forest clustered on the opposite side and empty fields stretching out on her side that works i have to go back she said tears stung at her eyes her chest filled with thick prickly pain it tasted bitter in the back of her throat but not like something she was going to throw up it was more something she would never be able to expel failure regret abandonment and emptiness it was a loneliness that had nothing to do with her family or Beck, really. It wasn't even Chiro's fault for all its obvious flaws. This was some poison in her soul, and she felt that she felt would cling to her insides and follow her like a curse. She would carry it all as she left Chiro at any age on any highway for any amount of miles. She wanted to get to the show, but deep down she knew it was too far. It was too late, and it was too little to fix what ate her up from the inside. I should go back. Her second whisper about giving up shocked her system more than the first. Her voice sounded pleading in her own ears. It dried up the tears like a sponge, and the feeling in her chest shattered with her heart beating hard for reasons beyond the climb of the hill. The nasty, jagged pieces of those feelings fell down through her inside, slicing at her guts and gathering in the pit of her, of her belly. But her chest rose and fell on night air in the vacuum left behind. Her eyes made out a glow on the horizon where the trees and the curve of the earth swallowed the highway. In her head, she knew that w that was miles away and probably still wasn't the light from the city and the civic center, but in her heart, she believed it was there, one foot in front of the other was all it would take to get there. She would get to the show late, but she would get there without Beck, without her parents, and without Chiro. Addison did not decide to walk again as much as she noticed her feet moving one step at a time down the backside of the rise. She simply decided not to stop herself. Another part of her mind thought about the drugged man with vomit on his chin like blood. He walked on a path back to Chiro. He walked on a path back to Chiro. She decided to turn around. He'd be on that path even if she went all the way to the Flex concert and came back wearing a Stigmata tour shirt for every penny she had saved and crammed in her jean pockets. That felt like two eternities away, though, on the other side of the eternity of the show. Forever is a long time at 14, but two forevers were unfathomable. Her parents' anger and punishment would be on the other side of those two infinities, laying end to end like sideways eights. They would be on the other side of sunrise, which she began to realize would come far sooner than any of those other things. If the glow, What if the glow on the horizon was the sun? She looked down at her watch in panic, but couldn't see the hands. Her arms shook, her arms shook as she walked, and her eyes still wanted to see spots popping up with every footstep and heartbeat. She should have had a digital watch with glowing hands. A dig had a digital watch with glowing hands. A digital watch or glowing hands. Or one with glowing hands. But who still wore a watch anyway? She took out her phone and thumbed up the hold screen, the date of the concert, the screenshot of the tour poster for her background, and the time still firmly in the middle of the night, past her bedtime for most nights, but not even midnight yet. Just keep walking. 
She tried not to look too far ahead. The horizon pulled in closer as she left the rise for as she left the rise for shadow shallow hills. The mysterious glow stayed out in the distance. The inclines were deceptive. She didn't realize she was working until her thighs burned or her right knee started to ache. From there it would move up to one hip or an ankle. Up to one hip or down. To an ankle. That's a good juxtaposition. She felt a raw spot on one heel, which was likely to become a blister. One big toe took on a sharp pain, like she labored to earn an, an ingrown, like she labored to earn an ingrown toenail. Like she, let's just throw in a was. I know that is terrible editing. Putting in a was, she was laboring to earn an ingrown toenail. The horizon and the light still stood too far away. She regretted looking and turned her eyes to the ground between her feet. She had to think about something else. It had to be something else besides her feet, or her hip, or her knee, or Beck leaving her and their favorite music behind, or her parents thinking of her music and her her shirts, thinking, or her parents thinking her music and her shirts and the red streak in her hair were going to send her to hell, to a hell they didn't really believe in. Her daddy's hell was on a highway near a picnic area before she was born. She imagined him sitting in that bar, perched near the road and the one stoplight, through the windows tinted like sunglasses to keep him and the other drunks from suffering too much from the sun. He'd watch the truck zip by faster than 45 miles per hour. The sun would go down and he would stay to burn off the rest of his pay and watch the disembodied orbs of headlights followed by the demon taillights escaping Chiro while he stayed. She looked up expecting another truck to roar by as if summoned by thought. Still the far horizon, the retreating glow, and the throbbing knee remained. Think about something else. John was the singer. Every picture of him was sweaty and soaked through his clothes clinging to his body. His hair around his eyes in dark strings like wild, filthy thoughts. He always had something to say, and he screamed it with passion. No one kept posters on their walls anymore, but she kept an album of pictures on her phone. He was not her everything. She loved the music, not just some sweaty guy with a voice. She liked lots of bands, but Flex was special. It meant something that they landed in the closest venue to her for a concert. It meant enough to walk it out, even if everyone else gave up. Jenny played guitar. She was an artist, and she shredded better than any two guys in any type of metal. She had skills, too, and played art. No one else understood what Jenny could do. No one around Addison's world, anyway. Beck couldn't have understood if she left this all behind for something else. Jenny's playing made life feel like it could be something. If Addison could never truly be free, she could dream that she could be somewhere else and be someone else. That much was possible. If something as beautiful and raw as Jenny's playing over the top of those driving beats from John's, with John's voice blasting through, if something like that was possible in the world that included a place like Chiro, then she could believe one day she could be something else, someone else, someplace else. Whatever light glowed over the hill became... Because of their music, that was a place a person could get to if they just kept putting one foot in front of the other for long enough. One foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. Think about something else. She noticed the smell before she saw it. It was rotten and stagnant. She looked to her left and saw the ponds spread out in a low dip within the, within the field and tall grasses around. <clears throat> if she had wandered too far to the left... While she stared at her feet, she might have tumbled right in before noticing it. Insects dotted the surface, causing ripples like rain she couldn't feel. The smell of the water was gamey and decayed. Whatever lay below the surface where the insects played like raindrops had time to come apart. The smell took on a perfume that almost reminded her of air out of a dryer vent. There was a raw sweetness with a chemical pungency underneath. The air carried the smell... The air carrying the smell was moist and humidly thick, though. It was perfume sprayed on a dead thing, and the slow rot came through. 
<clears throat> Excuse me. She looked she looked away from the pond and was almost on on the car. She was almost on the car parked where it ran off the highway before she saw it. And she almost and almost walked into. All right. Let's try that. She looked away from the pond and had all and almost walked into the car parked where it ran off the highway before she saw it. It's still awkward. She looked away from the pond and almost walked into a parked car. Walked into a parked car, comma, where it had and let's say and before she saw it run up the highway all right let's see if we fix that sentence she looked away from the pond and before she saw it almost walked into a parked car where it had run off the highway the nose had speared over the shoulder into the grass a buzz and tap pattern of static pulsed from the radio through the open driver's door of the red Trans Am. The overhead light glowed with a dim effort of a flashlight about to juice out the last bit from its from the batteries. Inside, the seatbelt looped up over the steering wheel, and the rearview mirror twisted almost sideways and aimed at the floorboard, but no one sat inside. She shuffled along closer to the edge of the pond, sure that some near-dead thing would reach out and latch onto her ankle as she passed. The static faded as she rounded the passenger side. Yellow painted flames swirled over the hood. Her... Do I have... I'm a little out. Okay, that's a little out of frame. <clears throat> Yellow painted flames swirled over the hood. Her eyes tried to form them into the shape of a bird, but as she left the car behind, she realized it was the profile of an Indian chief with a hooked nose and a full headdress <coughs> of fiery feathers. <coughs> Need to start taking more regular swallows. She thought, I bet this belongs to that meth head on his way to Chiro, where my parents sleep and where they think I'm sleeping too. Chills crawled up her middle, but only made it as far as her chest. That's when she spotted three people writhing on the ground across the highway on the opposite shoulder. Chills turned to a straight main line of ice water, and she thought she might piss herself on the spot. One of them lay on his back, or her back, on the rocks. Shirt pulled up and pants around the knees. The other two used their mouths across the body of the first. Dirty slurping noises carried across the lanes. One of them raised their head. Um... Not there. Let's say his or her. His or her. One of them raised his or her head and whipped the chin around to the side in Addison's direction. Her knees gave out and she went willingly to her belly in the grass a few feet beyond the Trans Am with the Indian face. All thoughts of the meth head to the west, Chiro, her parents, and even getting to the show evaporated. She could still smell the rot off the pond behind her. She watched the man go. Okay. It was a man. She watched him go back in mouth first. first. So gross. Addison lowered her face to the back of her hands, planted in the grass beyond, below the pavement. The way her thumbs touched and her forehead hooked around reminded her of how her mother used to make a heart shape. Hmm. Thumbs hooked and her forefingers hooked around reminded her of how her mother used to make a heart shape with her hands just to show that she loved Addison. She believed her mother still loved her, but the hand hearts had stopped at some point. 
Addison stopped returning the heart signal with age and hormones. Then she rolled her eyes when her mother still did it. She got especially embarrassed by it in public. Her mother had quit after that. Addison turned her head to the side in the grass so she wouldn't feel the heart shape with her face anymore. She stared into the headlights of another truck rolling out of the glow to the east along the darkness of the highway. The, tr the truck slowed and flashed its lights as it closed on the Trans Am. It rolled past Addison's position and cut off her view of the disgusting scene across the highway. The exhaust or the brakes hissed with a low tone she recognized, well, from living near the highway for so long. Porta potties. The back of the truck was loaded down with them and held in place by thick straps. The back two potties near the truck's gate buckled inward with the pressure of the straps. These had to be from the concert, right? Where else would anyone rent a dozens of, por of potties? If they were hauling off the shitters, then the concert really was over. She had missed it, must have. These could be from anywhere, being shipped to any festival in the country, but some part of her knew this was a warning that time had run out. The Civic Center had bathrooms. It was an inside concert. Maybe these they put these around the parking lot to keep metalheads and methheads from pissing all over everything outside. She hadn't been to any concerts, so what did she know? She knew she needed to get moving, and she needed to get away from the nasty people doing nasty things across the road from the Trans Am with the fiery Indian on it. The truck's engines roared and it drifted away from the scene. As the light, as the tail lights and running lights flashed around the truck upon its exit, she saw a woman leave the other two on the ground. More than one woman, no, super gross. The same bloody smears the same bloody smears down her face. What did it mean? Same as what? Down her face as the meth head. What did it mean? Addison gagged and turned her head away from the woman staggering up the center line of the highway after the porta potty truck. She slid down the slope toward the rotten sweet stink of the pond. She shuffled through the grass with her back hunched low to avoid being spotted. Everyone else headed toward Chiro, but she continued along the wrong side of the highway toward the light, toward her destiny. Once she felt she had shuffled far enough, she stood and ran without looking back. She felt the effort of the hills in her lungs and in her knees, but she continued to run. Addison stopped on a downslope and held her knees, heaving for breath. She did not look behind her, but she tried to listen for uneven footsteps and slurping, bloody lips. She gagged again and clutched the painful knot in her chest. As she could hear... All she could hear was the thump of her pulse in her neck and the swish of blood through her ears. She straightened and walked along the highway again, one foot in front of the other. Headlights rose on the curve of the road far from the highway on her side. She wasn't aware there was a road over there at all. The light cut sharp shadows through the trees, around houses and fences, and what she thought may be a swing set in one of the yards. The car raced along the back road too fast, for her to fully register the shadow puppets of the neighborhood from the passing light. Another property opened on the opposite side of the highway. It was a tall it had a tall iron double gate between two brick towers. A white picket fence extended out and and around the vast acres from there. Anyone could crawl over. The fence declared the boundary of the property line, but that de declaration alone was was meant to stop girls walking to concerts was meant to stop girls walking to concerts from running running away in the night okay i'm not okay i may need to fix this sentence the fence declared the bar barrier of the property but that declaration alone was meant to stop girls walking to concerts after running away in the night or meth heads who abandoned their trans ams anyone without the moral compass to respect the will of the white fence could roll right over the top or crawl underneath. Addison imagined that would be most every sort of person wandering the highway at night. The house, three stories tall from what she could tell by the lights in the scattered windows, sat far back on the hill along the winding drive from the great gate. 
a garage sat further back and to the right of the house. It had a half dozen doors across the front and had to be as big or bigger than the house itself. The front door to the house hung open, and the light issuing from the opening flickered and wavered. Addison stopped a few yards behind the gate and stared at the distant doorway and uneven light. Fire? Too bright to be candles. Too hot to light up a fireplace. She... Too hot to light up a fireplace. She knew nothing about how rich people lived. Maybe they kept their fireplaces burning year-round. Oh, I get it. Okay. Too hot outside to be lighting up a fireplace. There we go. She knew nothing about how rich people lived. Maybe they kept their fireplaces burning year-round just because they could. Then opened their front doors to let the heat out. Maybe big houses on big properties got colder inside. She could not picture a colder house than her own home with her parents and their consolation baby who wanted nothing more than to escape them in the night. A gunshot echoed down from the property and then another. Her eyes traced the windows but saw nothing. Another shot and then voices, laughing, screaming, drunken fun. Glass shattered and another shot carried through the night. Maybe rich people shot bottles behind their houses, just like poor people in Chiro. More alike than different. The light from the doorway grew brighter and shapes moved around inside. She moved on along the highway. She felt like the flashing lights appeared out of nowhere, but the highway grade spread flat in front of her and behind her for a long way. Okay, I know this is a section I need to work on because uh, I went through it several times. I found it a little confusing. They had, I mean, in the past when I was first editing it, so maybe I fixed it. I don't know. They had to have been in view for some time. She glanced over her shoulder for the gate to the rich people's house, but it was nowhere in sight. She must have been walking for some time. She was either watching her feet the whole time or had been dozing off while she was walking. That couldn't be possible, she thought. Two fire trucks on one side of the road held ahead bled red and white light across everything. Police cars on the other side competed with blue and white. An ambulance with no lights with no lights on sat diagonally across one lane. Three or four other cars wrapped around each other between. One lay upside down off the road between the ambulance and the first police car. Red road flares burned in front of and behind the scene. They seemed dim under the lights of the trucks and cars. As she watched, two of the flares burned out and went dark on the street. Unless this just happened, the trucks heading west had to go around this. She continued to approach the scene, looking for the crews moving around, but could not see anyone through the assault of red, blue, and white, which did not blend well as they strobed over each other. It's time to give up, she whispered. Turn yourself in and go home. She knew her parents would be furious and insane with fear. They let another child wander out into the street. The police bringing her home would know it. Everyone in town would know, and they would mention the boy who didn't make it past three. They would say it behind hands, and the rest of the family would say it with their eyes. Addison would suffer under their fearful captivity for this sin. But she was sleeping on her feet now. It was one thing to hide and sneak around meth heads and weird sex parties around Trans Ams. It was another thing to think she could sneak past police while she was all ready to collapse from exhaustion. She reached the fire truck and stared through the angry lights into the empty cab. The driver's door hung open. The police car stood empty as well. A radio crackled inside one of them. A distant voice competed with the static for a few lost syllables, but then gave up the battle. The static pulsed through the speaker with the same dead rhythm as the radio in the Trans Am. The hair on the back of her neck prickled up and chills ran from her belly to her throat. She found herself wanting to draw closer to the rich family's fire. The thought of the open door with the lights pouring out into the darkness filled her with deeper fear as she looked at the open doors on the vehicles and the silent lights whirling on top. Patches of oil spotted the highway in random splotches. 
tire marks thick enough to be from the big trucks headed west, stretching out f from some of the puddles. The stuff that she thought was oil spills looked deep enough to swim through. Light played across the glistening, greasy surface. The white lights hit in flashes between other colors and almost made the spills look, like, look red like blood. She heard something behind her, and she turned away from the street. Addison felt a scream of fear rising inside her, but it caught, and no sound escaped her mouth. The lights prevented her from seeing anything out of the dark grasses, but her mind provided the shapes of figures staggering about. They had filth down their chins and clothes and shades, which could be blood, under the right kind of light. She turned and ran past the fire trucks. The light still foiled her vision as she tried to see past her hallucinations into the reality of the night. Whatever was or wasn't out there, this was not the time or place to surrender herself to anyone or anything. Any creatures who might be overseeing this scene would not take her safely home were she to turn herself in. I'm going to put a comma there. She knew this deep down in the creeping places of her soul. Addison found the will to run again as she lost the courage to look for figures in the dark highway grasses of the night. She wasn't aware of when it happened, but she returned to a steady walk at some point. She drifted in her dazed walk of one foot in front of the other along the wrong side of the road. Headlights raced past her from with more cars than trucks now. She drifted out from the shoulder as the headlights approached and then closed in on the paved road again as demon taillights retreated westward. In her half-sleeping mind, her she pictured the cars barreling into the abandoned vehicles and the dying road flares. She saw the lights dancing over wet streets, which bled oil. She pictured it in the front of the bar. She pictured it in front of the bar in Chiro, where, the, where her father spent his nights. In the half dream, she saw him alone in the dark, pouring his own drinks in a glass with no ice. It spilled out over his chin, thick like blood. As fear and awareness started to rise up and her rise from her her belly up, the images broke apart and faded. She remained in her walking trance of one foot in front of the other. At some point, her mind registered a switch from darkness to light to the light of dawn. It was it was the flip of a switch where one moment it was dark and the next she saw the first half of sunrise in her face. She stopped and looked around her and up into the first colors of the sky. She tried to think how close she was to the city. A gas station set, sat ahead of her, sat ahead on her side of the road. Farther ahead, a shopping center spread out with a laundry, a tax office, a bail bondsman, a vegan market, and a pancake house. They were all closed. Watch almost 6 a.m. Addison wondered why no cars had passed her in the night. Her mind played the flash of headlights and taillights, but she did not register it as a memory. A flash of her father bleeding from his mouth inside the bar passed over the screen inside her head. Her heartbeat increased and she shook off the strange vision. The concert is over. What are you even doing here? She, could, she had no answer. The gas station was the one her parents stopped at on the way into the city so they wouldn't have to get off one of the busy exits in the city limits because the civic because of the civic center traffic. She was too close to give up now. There were a few miles and a few exits ahead. There was forever and a strange there was forever and strange sights on the highway behind her. She yawned and wished she had brought a hat. There had been no thought of sunshine when she started this ill-planned adventure. Addison put one foot in front of the other, and soon the closed gas station and pancake house lay behind her, along with the strange highway leading all the way back to Chiro. Her parents would be awake. They would check on her soon if they hadn't already. They would panic. There was no smoothing this over anymore, no matter how it ended. She kept walking. She passed a seafood restaurant on her right with a patio, a patio three feet from the side of the road, which had a real concrete curb. A shirt lay on the grass be below the iron fencing. 
Addison stared at it as she passed and realized she was looking for blood. There was none, but the tables and umbrellas lay turned over and scattered. The long window across the door was shattered. Had shattered. Most of the rest of the shopping center consisted of a food line grocery store and several boutique shops. A Home Depot and a Michael's craft store took up the massive empty parking lot on the left. A Cracker Barrel restaurant stood as an isolated island in the lot, also not open. That had to be a sign of the end of the world if nothing else was. The parking spaces on both sides also stood devoid of cars where people should be wondering why the Cracker Barrel, the Pancake House, or the gas stations weren't open. A man sat slumped in one of the middle rockers on the restaurant's porch between the giant checkerboard and a pew bench. The old man spilled over on the left arm of the rocker until his knuckles rested on the ground. His ear lay on his shoulder with his chin against his chest, hiding his face. She hustled along past the store, hoping the man wouldn't rise his, raise his head. Why it mattered, she couldn't say, but Addison felt sure it would be bad if he did. She crossed an empty... Yep. She cro uh, da, 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 da. She hustled along the path... Of, uh, I lost my place. She crossed an empty street with the light changing from green to yellow to red for no traffic. She passed a bank, which also which was also still closed, and walked under the cover of the drive through window teller. As she, stepped up, as she stepped on the strip of grass between the thin trees for the bank's landscaping, she saw smoke rising dark from three different sources deeper in the city. She thought of factory smokestacks, but some creeping place in her mind told her that wasn't it at all. The dark plumes represented something else. Oracles and smoke gave omen and final sign that she should have turned back long ago when the highway was still dark and she had not yet crossed infinity through the night. No sirens. If this was truly something else, there should be sirens. The creeping feeling on the bottom of her brain wouldn't heal, though. A group of a dozen people stepped out from between a Piggly Wiggly and a Bed Bath and Beyond. They crossed the larger lot of the bath store, diagonally to Addison's position. Sunlight drew back all illusion that the smears down their faces and clothes were anything except blood. The oil on the street at the accident, with all the cops and firefighters gone, the rich house with the open with the door open fire with the door open and a fire flickering. Gunshots and shattered glass. Oh, I get it. There we are. With the door open, fire flickering, gunshots and shattered glass. The nasty lovers going in mouth first across from the Trans Am. The meth head wandering through the night like a zombie. All headed toward Chiro. One of the wandering bodies revealed exposed bone through the arm torn away. Where the arm tore away messy above the elbow. The cheek hung ripped down to the teeth and gums with meaty flaps of flesh left behind on the on the side of the skull. One of the women had an empty hole for one of her eyes. As they wandered, she turned em she turned her empty socket toward Addison and the bank. Addison dropped to her knees but still felt exposed on the grass which edged the back lot of the bank. The bloody wanderers crossed the highway without looking and angling toward the food lion. She turned and ran for the bank and away from the wanderers. She stopped at the corner of the Piggly Wiggly and turned and turned in a full circle. I should I don't want to use away twice. Sorry about that. I was just considering whether I should specify she's running away from the bank, but I think it's clear I just read it wrong. Which way to the Civic Center? Something crashed inside the pig, and then the glass impacted with a thump from the inside a few panes down from the actual door where she stood. The white swatch of reflection of reflected street wavered with the hit. She could not make out the shape inside, but she thought about the broken window at the seafood place and the bloody gang strolling through the parking lot. Addison turned and ran through the parking lot several feet from the highway. The buildings gave way to grass. High above stone soundproofing walls along the multiple lanes. 
Construction equipment filled the broad dirt median, but none of the workers had shown up either. She crossed streets next to overpasses, looking cautiously in both directions before continuing along the high grass next to the trees. After the third overpass, she realized she was looking for wandering people, not traffic. The highway curved ahead of her, and the ramp for an exit rose away from the right lane. A green sign with reflective letters declared this was the exit for the Civic Center. The traffic snarled in every lane in both directions, beginning here. A tractor trailer had jackknife blocking the west, blocking the way west. She th saw three accidents on the eastbound lanes extending beyond the exit. One car on the shoulder sat engulfed in orange flame, with smoke as dark as tar billowing from underneath. No sirens. No one coming to help. Most cars sat open and the vehicles abandoned. She saw a body face down on the ground between lanes. Don't get up, she prayed. More wanderers strolled east between the westbound lanes under the shade of the overpass for her exit. As they emerged in the morning light, she saw their torn clothes and bloody wounds. They lurched and wavered like the meth head zombie had. She continued above the highway. As she continued above the highway, she saw the high windows, glass walls, and elegant curve of the Civic Center. Why am I still bothering? She left the top of the highway wall and cut through the trees anyway. Her shoes sounded too loud in the leaves. She stopped but still heard crunching footsteps. Addison dropped to her knees and looked around. A woman wearing a stigmata tour shirt torn open to one cup of her bloody pink bra staggered between the trees to Addison's left. She turned to watch the woman leave the woods and step across the grass. She reached the top of the wall, lifted a foot out into space above the highway. She won't do it. The woman stepped off as if she expected to fly and vanished off the side faster than Addison's brain could follow the motion. The unseen impact off the drop came sharp and metallic. The soundproofing wall had not done such a great job. Her stomach growled and her own hunger on the, on the tail of that strange woman's suicide made Addison queasy. She stood and rushed through the trees to the grounds and sidewalk behind the center. She looked up at the wall of glass, which extended several stories above her and had blue tinting. The scant forest behind her and the deadly canyon of highway twisted into nightmarish shapes over the surface. She saw the shape move toward her through the reflection. Addison whipped around, expecting to see the creature coming from behind. Nothing. She turned back as the bloody man walked face first into the inside of the glass in front of her. He bounced off and fell to his back, leaving a bloody smear where his face had hit. Addison backed to the edge of the sidewalk. The, bo the mangled body inside found its feet again, and Addison marveled there was enough muscle left on its bones to stand and move. It craned its neck to look at her through the glass and around the smear. Its, its extended throat opened to vocal cords, and the bones of the esophagus. Addison wasn't hungry anymore. The creature, would, which could not be alive, clawed at the glass. The jaw opened and closed. Its tongue traced out between the teeth with each opening. Addison followed the sidewalk around the wall, and the creature followed her from pain to pain. Its hands thumped past the metal barriers between sections of glass. It had hit its head once and stumbled, but returned to the glass. As the sidewalk sloped up, the wall turned to alternating brown and white block. She left the windows behind and hoped the thing inside the glass didn't find its way to, the, to a door. The parking lot spread out below her. This appeared to be where all the cars in the city had ended up. The porta potties lined one side, so they had not been picked up. A boat of a car had run through one of the potties, leaving a mash of plastic, blue water, and filth. It ran down the grass and took out one section of fence. Driver's door sat open, much like the vehicle along the highway in the night. Other cars had attempted to flee, but failed. A few windshields were cracked and sh or shattered. Others were splattered on the inside or out. 
The wanderers on the far side of the lot moved aimlessly through the rows. A few writhed in, in their seatbelts within the cars. Others, other wanderers ignored them. She turned and faced the entrance to the civic center. To the center, the row of doors stood broken all the way across, until the shards, until the shards and pellets caused the sidewalk and foyer to look like a pond. She glanced behind her to be sure nothing crawled toward her with its throat torn out, but its jaws still working. None of the wanderers appeared to have noticed her. I came this far. Nothing about that statement felt right or true. Running felt right. Hiding felt right. Getting the hell out of there felt like the right choice because so many of the others who came to the show now on time couldn't. Blood spilled like oil. Beck and her boyfriend had dodged this whole nightmare and Addison could have too. If only I had been my usual disappointing self for one more night. Her feet were moving again one in front of the other. She realized once her sneakers crunched on grass. Then the shadows of the venue swallowed her. She stood and listened. Air still hummed through the vents. The wooden doors across opened to the back rows of the seats. A few floor lights remained on, but the stage and the front sections sank in blackness. The seats she could see lay torn and twisted. Shapes of debris sat where the light failed. It could have been fabric or more bodies. She turned away from the auditorium she had come so far to reach. She crunched towards the exit again until her eyes caught the shirts hanging from a booth rack above the table. Merch. She left the glass and her shoes squeaked on the tile. Flex bandanas, shirts, backpacks, and CDs. Who still listened to CDs? Lanyards, bottle openers, bobbleheads, ball caps, coffee mugs, water bottles... She looked behind her before grabbing a backpack with John's sweaty face on it. She t stuffed in a couple CDs anyway. She'd figure out how to play them later. She took a few bandanas, a couple repeats she knew, but she had snuck out and now was stealing. No time to be picky. Chaos and Apocalypse. No time to be picky. I think that needs a period. Chaos and Apocalypse might justify it. Chaos and an Apocalypse. Alright, so no time to be picky. Chaos and an Apocalypse might justify it, but the creep in her soul told her she was excusing herself. She pulled a green flex cap over the red streak dyed in her hair. The tag hung down hung down by her ear but she left it none of the shirts were her size lots of triple x xls either they expected a lot of fat fans or all the little girls bought them all before everything went bad she climbed up on her knees on the table and thumbed through the tags along the racks the plastic tabletop strained and popped on the metal legs under her weight it hit her in the back knocking knocking her and the pack off behind the table. The shirts wavered on the racks. The creature with the ripped throat leaned over and reached for her. A slick string of gore oozed out from the dark hole at the base of the, of the wound. The creature hissed and clicked instead of speaking or growling. She scooted back, and the man-thing pumped its legs until the table flipped, scattering CDs. The booth walls began to fold. She grabbed her stolen pack and the closest shirt without checking the size. She started to get to her feet, but then reached past the spilled bobbleheads of the bass player and drum drummer to grab the last pair of John and Jenny dolls. She snagged another baseball cap too, this one blank, this one black. The monster kept coming, crunching the CD jewel cases under its knees. Addison backed to the wall and dodged around the collapsed booth. The creature crashed out, crashed out with a pink flex bandana pasted to its bloody chest. She stuffed the rest of her stolen goods into the pack and shouldered it on the run. More creatures in as bad of shape as the throatless man wandered out of the seating area. Their eyes lighted on Addison, and they reached for her with jaws open and bloody teeth showing. 
She ran over the pool of glass and into the growing heat of daytime in the vast parking lot, eyes turned on her from the rows of cars closer to the entrance. The creatures honed in from outside as the throatless man and the others wandered out behind her. She looked to the right at the endless cars extending to the gates, which appeared closed from that distance. From this distance. Which appeared closed from this distance. She looked left. More cars, the porta potties and the nose of the abandoned car through the fence. She made a break for the fence, trying to look under the ins and inside cars as she weaved through. She heard hands and bodies hitting the vehicles behind her. Motion between bumpers revealed bodies crawling along the ground and reaching. Each step she expected a hand to close around her ankle and take her down. She kept going even though her feet hurt, her knees throb, and every muscle felt watery, one foot in front of the other. She splashed through the filth of the busted potty and trudged up the grassy slope. Every step was torture, and she felt herself slowing down. Her muscles cramped and threatened to fold her. Growls rose behind her, and she found the will to keep pushing upward past the open driver's door, past the bumper, through the gap in the chain fence, and through the gap in the chain link. A sharp twist of wire caught a loose strap of her flex pack. She spun from the strap on her shoulder and saw the throatless man using the side of the car as he climbed toward her. In the distance, more bodies poured into the crowd and stalked after her. Two more crashed out of the side door of the Civic Center into the sunlight. One had a full beard and the other a purple soul patch with his head shaved. Some of their wounds went down to skull, to the, to skull bone. The bearded man had a, an eyeball dangling over his cheek by a cord of optic nerve. It bounced against his hooked nose as he walked. They could have been the bass player and the drummer. It was hard to tell with them torn up like that. Could have been fans who admired those two for some strange reason. Their heads did bobble, resembling their dolls. She saw, she saw no one in the crowd who looked like John or Jenny. Maybe they made it out of whatever this was. It was possible. There was hope. They could get a new bass player and drummer easy. Lots of bands did. Addison would still have their music until then, and they would continue to speak to her like they, always, like they had always done. She missed the show, but she completed her journey. Addison unsnagged her pack from the wire and continued her climb up the slope beyond the fence. She stumbled onto her hands and knees, feeling her exhaustion deep. Let's say her deep exhaustion. All right. The fence rattled behind her and she moved again. Addison moved her feet. Okay, we did move twice. Addison Addison worked. Addison worked her feet as she used her hands too to take the slope. The crest of the hill felt so far away and that grass cut between her fingers like the edge of paper and the grass cut between her fingers like the edge of paper she kept going no idea what was over the top more roads a burning city more wandering monsters she knew what lay behind her so she opted for the mystery and the forever journey ahead the night before raced through her mind beck's betrayal sneaking out the meth head zombie on the highway walking toward chiro the wandering trans am the abandoned trans am with the monsters eating before they followed the porta potty truck toward Chiro, the rich house on fire, the missing police officers, firefighters, and victims, walking to Chiro too, where her family slept. They knew by now she was gone, and they would be looking. They might not know about all this death spreading out from the city, though. Along the highway, would they call Beck's parents, and could she tell? And would she tell? Would her father be driving in a panic toward the city, trying not to lose another child under the wheels under the wheels along the highway, into the arms and teeth of monsters spreading out from the city? For the first time in her life, Addison wanted nothing else in the world but to get home. The creeping feeling tried to tell her she wouldn't make it out of the city. It tried to tell her that by the time she got to Chiro, if she ever did, it would be too late. 
If she had stayed, she might have died in Chiro with them, too. She needed to hide. She needed to escape and not go back along the highway of death. Returning to Chiro after she had finally escaped was certain death. Addison pushed those feelings and thoughts down so she could focus on getting home. She had come this far, and now she needed to finish the journey. Even if it didn't make sense, she needed to finish it. She reached up and ripped the tag off her green cap. With the death behind her... With the death... Okay, let's say the hungry. With the hungry death behind her... With the hungry death behind her, she climbed the hill, hand over hand, and one foot in front of the other. And that is that. Again, this story is going to appear in 31 Stories for Halloween on my Patreon page. And uh, you can see that for just a dollar, and you get a new story every day all through the month of October. So I appreciate my Patreons, and appreciate anyone who took the time to watch this video. Thank you very much.